So I have survived. Uh, please go check out the previous parts. I have survived uh, to gauge your bearings right. So many death curses in the past couple of years. Um, all of them have come from men. No, one has come from a woman. A cousin of mine has put a death curse on me. Uh, no, actually two. Two came from women. Uh, but the grand majority of them came from men. And the grand majority of them came from men who were committing crimes of passion. In other words, it was romantically linked. They wanted me dead for love reasons. There's only one person that has cast a spell on me because I would be embarrassing if at all I continued alive. And it was a former person that used to work in my organization at MTN. Uh, and so therefore, if my case throve, because they saw how strong I was, if my case continued on like this, I would, I'm basically like Julia Roberts in the Pelican Brief. I keep on saying that. Uh, then it would be embarrassing for them. So this person tried to kill me, but it was long ago and they just stopped trying. After the first time that it failed, they were like, ah, whatever, our life is destroyed anyway. And they just moved away from me. Uh, all the other death curses that have come my way have come from men who had some kind of romantic interest in me and it didn't go well. And so, yeah, basically gender-based violence. And then there are two women who <laughs> try one, try to sap sacrifice me for money. Uh, both of them actually try to sacrifice me to gain something, but the other one tried to kill me before I got too embarrassing. Okay, and uh, I shall highlight that both of them were in my family. Anyway, uh, right, oh, these are the things that God has shown me. So for me to walk around my family members and still greet them, like today there were two of them here. It's like, <laughs> yo, guys, like I've seen what you've done, but you know, chief of, chief of sinners is in heaven today. His name is Paul. So uh, whatever, maybe you'll repent one day. Bottom line is, I don't think so which crowd that can ever come up against me. So remember, in the earlier parts, I spoke about how it is that uh, I, I used to laugh at these witches that indeed were like little children in Mary Poppins type Wizard of Oz sorcery. It's not even all that intense, but they think they're dangerous. Well, in the beginning of my faith, I indeed looked at them as such, just little children that are playing with fire. But at the end of the day, whether or not it is a little child that is an arsonist or a grown man, it is still power to kill. Do you understand? They're playing with, the, with weapons that actually kill. And the Lord has given me respect for the occult, basically. And the fact that, albeit we as believers having might over it, exorbitant might, super strength over it, it is dangerous at the end of the day, and it can kill. And even if it doesn't knock you as Garabo down, if you do not stand in the gap for certain people that might by collateral damage be afflicted by it, they get knocked down. I lost a brother. He was killed because of a death curse and operation that didn't come to me, and it knocked him out. My dad that night would have put me in a position to die because he would have kicked me out of an environment and I would have had nowhere to go and I would have ended up dead. And so that death curse, since it could not be satiated, since that blood needed to be drunk to satisfy demons that were already sent, it needed to drink, drink somebody's blood and the whole thing turned around and literally knocked down the domino that was my unsaved brother. He was the one that was taken instead of me. That's what you need to understand. So it is therefore important as Christians to not take lightly the fact that we get knocked down and we get up again. We're never going to be left down. We get knocked down. We mustn't take for granted that if at first we don't succeed, dust yourself off and try again. That though a wicked, though a righteous man may fall seven times, he or she gets up seven times, but the wicked are suddenly overcome by calamity. We know that the gates of Hades don't prevail against the church, that we trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing harms us. We know that Psalm 91 is an operation that God's, God uh, charges his angels concerning us that we might not strike our feet against the stone. The Lord charged angels concerning me because some blood needed to be spilled. Do you understand? My father is dead because of the same thing. He had cancer, yes, but the Lord showed me it could have been cured. I didn't even mention that my father died because I was exhausted. I was already dealing with so much at the time of his death that I literally could not get around to talking about that in particular. His life would not have been snuffed out if it was not for the operating death curse of this man in particular. But he's still trying and it's going to take somebody else. Because these demons, they're out for blood, they want to drink it, and they will drink it no matter what. That's what I'm trying to help you guys understand. And a lot of times, when death curses are done against by Satanists, against Christians, Satan knows that he's not going to prosper to spill the blood of the saint. But blood spilled at all is beneficial for him. And the death of a saint is not precious in the sight of Satan. It is precious in the sight of God. So while we might be getting beheaded all over the show across the world, like those um, Christians uh, that got killed by ISIS at the beach, while we might get shot, while we might get 
shot. Uh, sorry, I mentioned shot, sorry, but well, we might get thrown overboard to die. The devil doesn't really gain anything out of the death of a Christian other than the appearance of God not being powerful enough to rescue them. And so he keeps people out from heaven by causing them to look onto the martyrdom of a saint. But you know that saying uh, that has been created in Christendom that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Often the martyrdom of a Christian causes the church to grow. But the devil is always just trying to discredit Christian witness through martyrdom. He knows that when a Christian dies, something glorious happens. They go to heaven. For precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his Christians. But beneficial to the cause of Satan is the death of an unregenerate man. So therefore, many of times when occult people, magicians and sorcerers, do a death curse against a Christian that will inevitably fail, the devil is more than anything gunning for where it is that this death curse, this blood, will ultimately go and get spilled. The Lord will send his angels concerning us. He will charge them. We will get saved. We will get rescued. We will stand erect. We will be cool. So therefore, Satan is trying with that to see where the Lord will redirect that wicked energy, what it is that the Lord will allow to rather be taken instead of his kid. And oftentimes it's an unbeliever. It's more like, you know, if I had to choose between Karabo and Katejo, that was my brother's name, then it's going to be Katejo. If it has to be somebody within this lineage, it's not that God's hands are tied, but it's that the occult ultimately achieves ends that will get them judged in the end and that the Lord will not allow his saints to be moved, his saints to be taken haphazardly if it is not his will that they should get to martyrdom if it's not his children, if, it, if it's not, if it's not his will for Garabo to die on the tw- uh, to die, sorry, on the twelfth of October, if that's not what he has set apart from eternity past, Garabo will not die on the twelfth of October. But the occult demands that blood, so the spirit will go around dry, arid places to drain any blood at all, and it will ca- conquer the one who has no self control, no protection, no shielding, no yielding to the Holy Spirit. And so my brother died. My father recently also passed away. Um, my dad was saved when he died, even though he was uh, very rebellious for the chunk of his life. He made right with God in the end. He was old, right? However, and the Lord was like, I will take my son rather than Karabo, who still has time to go for this is the time for my son to come home. My dad and I were at enmity and at odds when he died. I didn't even go to his funeral, but he is safe with Christ, even though I'm still embittered by what he did to me. I will overcome that hurdle of unforgiveness later on. But once reconciliation happens in heaven, there will be no such bitterness or irritation with what was done. Because he allowed my, my mom in this persecuting season to get away with murder. Like, he was given an opportunity to be better than what he was when I came up. And instead, he decided to use me anyway to continue to get groceries and what have you. So there was a lot of bitterness in me. He was the one that was knocked out of the way because of the sorcery of this man. So he is basically responsible for the death of my dad and the uh, former death curses that that opera that death curse that was in operation when my brother died the person who sent it is responsible for my brother's blood even though they would have been responsible for mine if i had capitulated which i never can because i was sealed so i'm trying to help you guys understand that even though you might stand on your authority as a christian and indeed rightly so trust that nothing can shake you you're like mount zion you've got family members that can be shaken by dark arts you've got friends that you stand to mourn bitterly at the funerals of that could die in the very accident that Satan is trying to kill you in. I remember listening to a testimony of a former witch. Now, let's go to the next part.